You know, everything I have is from a trap in the water and what comes out of it or what doesn't come out of it. What do I love about fishing? I could go on forever on that one. You know, every day you go fishing, it's a new challenge. You never know what you're gonna catch. And that's what keeps it really interesting for me. I got into fishing because my father was a fisherman and he wanted me to try it. I tried it, I loved it, and I've been here 10 years. I'm a third generation fisherman. My father and grandfather, my grandfather came over from Greece actually in like 1911. I was one of the first fishermen out of Newport. My father went into it and I started going out with him when I was a little boy and I just fell in love with it and I've done it my whole life. I've been lucky enough to do something that I really love my whole life. It's not an easy job. You gotta go out there and work for 20 hours a day, sleep for five, go back and do it again, for, do that for 10 days straight. It's not easy to find guys like that these days. At the end of the day, you carve out and you grind out a living and that's okay with me. Anybody that's my age and has been in the business that long entered into a, a wide open fishery. It was pretty much the only limitations were how hard you wanted to work. When I first started, we used to refer to it as fishing by the moth method. You see a bunch of bright lights, you head to it. Boom bust, you know, you make a lot of money for a couple of years and then you're off moving on to another resource. My last year fishing snow crab, the quota was 400 and 35, 440 million pounds. This year it was 5.3, and they're gone. Sustainability is a must, not an option, because if we don't fish sustainably, there's not gonna be anything left. I think like every fisherman does, it's, it's our livelihood. It's what our investment is. So I think any fisherman you ask would say, yes, we wanna fish sustainably. I think the fishermen have a higher perspective of sustainability and I think they have a larger respect than maybe what they used to have. I think they've come to a higher realization that this is going to be the future you know, of their pocketbook and the next generation of commercial fishermen. So they're paying attention a lot more as far as sustainability is concerned and I think they're more involved in the process by and large. Well, sustainability is important for a number of reasons. One, uh, you know, so I can have a job long term and my kids could do it if they wanted to do it. And you know, not only that, you want to give back to the resources. The resources provided a very good living for me, put four kids through college. Uh, and I, I think I owe it to, to make sure that it's a sustainable fishery in long term. None of us want to fish ourselves out of a job. You know, I'd like to see this continue and make a whole career out of it. I think a lot of young fishermen share that sentiment. It seems like the new generation coming in is the one that understands it's a science. It's a scientifically based harvest and, and you can't fish anymore, you have to harvest. We're, we're headed that direction and, and some people are headed there kicking and screaming, but it will happen. It's not an option, it's, it has to happen. In my career, I've seen that there are many members of the fishing industry who are really committed ocean stewards. They make their living off the ocean and, and therefore it's probably more important to them than it is for many people. And so as a result, they collaborate, they cooperate with scientists and that can include things like carrying environmental sensors on their boats or on their gear, using their boats as research platforms or taking scientific teams out to conduct more in-depth research, providing samples of fish to research teams to do lab-based analyses, providing their own just observations and insights on what's going out there. There's any number of ways uh, that fishermen can and are um, supporting the scientific enterprise. And it's, it's more important now than ever. So I've been uh, collaborating with different organizations for over 30 years now, yep. collecting data with and for marine biologists. And I believe in doing that because if you're gonna manage a fishery, you need the absolute best data you can collect. And I feel that I'm in a position where I'm on the ocean all the time, every day almost, that I can collect the good data that the scientists need to use for their research. They see firsthand the species, they understand how the fisheries operate, they understand how the system's changing, firsthand observations, and having that information translate into some of the science that scientists use to inform the stock assessments or um, spatial management of our oceans, as well as then the decision-making process on those topics is an integral part of what we're trying to do. So this 
This is one of the tools that we use to measure bottom temperature. We lower it down to the bottom, anywhere depths from 200 to 600 feet. We measure temperature, salinity. So we do this probably, oh, three or four times a year. And then we have another one in the boat that we have in the traps that we have fixed to the traps. And uh, that, that is read by Bluetooth on the vessel. As soon as the trap comes up, Bluetooth reads it, and we get a graph on a little tablet, exactly what's happening right then. So we've been doing these type of studies for over 30 years, and we're trying to get trends. I mean, one year does not tell you much. You gotta get things over years and years. And we're starting to see how the bottom's slowly warming. That affects the movement of the lobsters, movement of the crabs. The crabs will crawl at a certain temperature. The lobsters crawl at a little bit different temperature and they shut off at a certain temperature. As soon as the water, it's kind of like a bear. I mean, when they get, the water gets to be a certain temperature on the, on the bottom, that's it, they're done. They're not moving. You put a piece of the, the best food in the world for them, they're not gonna eat it once the water gets to a certain temperature. It's almost like you can take your graph, put the water temperature graph up and put your catch graph next to it and everything's temperature sensitive. The, the problem with this is that I'm at one fisherman in one area you know, 100 miles away from where I am, the temperature on the bottom is different, even 10 miles or five miles away. So the more fishermen that have these units to uh, measure this stuff is a win-win for everybody, you know, I think. We are in an ongoing race to try to understand what's happening and sort of where the ecosystem is going. In my view, fishermen are incredibly important partners in, in that endeavor. They're in many ways the front line eyes on the water. They're essentially applied naturalists that have to continually work to understand a changing ocean and take that understanding into you know, business decisions that they need to make, not just day by day, but in some cases, minute by minute. You know, scientists will go out there once or twice a year, or, you know, maybe a few times a year. We're out there every single week. So we say things that they don't see. You can't replace that with anything else. Experience is the best teacher. So if we can bring something to the table that'll help the scientists and they can manage the fisheries properly, I'm all for it 100%. Everybody from scientists, managers, and members of the industry bring really valuable knowledge and insight into the problems that we're facing. So working together to solve those problems is perhaps the only path forward to do it successfully. Leave all the baloney red tape. You need a fisherman, a scientist, and an engineer. If you all work together, it's like a fine mesh. You're gonna get something done. If everybody goes off in their own separate venues to do whatever, nothing seems to get done. Commercial fishermen, I'll always say this, are, are like a MacGyver. They, they adapt and fix everything that they get involved with, whether it's a broken boat, a net, sustainability, working with science to make a net that works to just catch, in this case, skates and not other fish, catch a specific crab pot that catches red crabs in the right location. Fishermen are all MacGyvers. They always readjust themselves and work through the process. So this is just an example of how much rope it actually takes to make one of our trawls. And a, a trawl is just a group of 150 traps that are all attached to one. You know, as you can see, it's a lot of rope. It's three miles of rope laying on the bottom and then two 600 fathom end lines, which goes from your anchor to your buoy on top. That's how you find the gear. You know, they want to cut down the number of end lines we have, which is the number of lines that go from the anchor to the surface that mark where all your traps are. You know, our entire fishery has 16 of those versus, you know, the lobster fishery that's got thousands of them. But um, that's really the goal is they want to reduce entanglement. The right whale issue has been around for a long time, but I just finished eight years of a closure, not eight consecutive 12 months, but the closure starts from February 1st to May 1st or May 15th in state waters. No fishing. <laughs> it's pretty simple. There is no gear allowed in a specific mapped out area. And that's a closure. And in those eight years, there was one closure in Great South Channel in Mass Bay Restricted Area. And now I can count. They've gotten bigger and more, and there'll be more to come. So what we're trying to do is think of ways 
that we can fish responsibly in closed areas with this uh, on-demand gear. This is a little acoustic unit. It's a smelts system, smelts lift bag. It's just a small little demo. You could use it as a toy with an edge tech modem in it. Right now, we're just gonna throw it in the water in the slip and we'll pop it for you and just show you how it works. I get about a total of probably, oh geez, 14 to 15 units in the water right now. You gonna toss it? I'll toss it. Okay, so you send a signal down to it. Uh, that's the acoustic, and there's a transducer on the unit that's listening for like the command to re open up the valve of the air tanks and start filling that yellow bag that was on the top. Here is my tablet, and that's going to show you that system right here, right in the marina. It's a single trap. Okay, I'm pressing recover right now, and it's gonna search, hit unit. It's waiting for a response from my deck box. When I hear the beeps, it'll, it will has picked it up. There it is, there it comes. That's to the surface, now you just gotta go over and pick it up. So we're in a new age now that we're trying to figure out the way that Fishermen and right whales can coexist in the ocean because generally we love what we do. With our, I'm not saying knowledge, but us fishing the gear, talking to the engineers, do this, this, and this, can you change this, this, and this, the stuff will keep on getting better. From the get-go, there was so many naysayers like, this will never work. And now, you know, we're at 80, 90, 95% success rates, and we're proving that it can work. There are a lot of fishermen who really care about what's going on, who are working with the scientific community, NGOs, and with a lot of support from them also. And I got a, a wise fisherman told me, a friend of mine, you can throw your hat in the sand and kick your hat and get upset, and what do you have? You have a dirty hat. I'll keep on kicking the can down the road. And it's not just the lobster fishery. There's a gillnet fishery, you know, there's a lot that is going on to, you know, save the North Atlantic right whale. I started thinking about the ropeless buoys when it appeared that it was going to get forced onto the industry, and you have to figure out how to fish without buoys. I like a challenge. And I've got a couple of captains that have very forward thinking. I said, well, so what do you think about this? And then I hooked up with Good Machine, they're the engineers that can answer the questions that I can't. Good Machine's mission is to solve climate change with solutions that can be brought to market really quickly. Yeah, we're primarily super practical engineers who are taking technology that already exists and applying it to problems that need to be solved right away. Here you have our uh, underwater robots that plant coral. This is the first robot in the world to successfully plant corals. And so it's got an underwater drill and grinding disc. It prepares a site for the coral to live in and then transplants one of these little corals on a plug with a metal clip that biodegrades as the coral's growing to join the rest of the reef. Here we have our uh, robot on skis that plants seagrass uh, to restore ecosystems. Cool stuff. I never should have been a fisherman. You what? I said, I never should have been a fisherman. I should have done this. <laughs> <laughs> John came to us with the concern that vertical lines in the water column were a concern for him, for others, and that the technology to solve this shouldn't be that hard to implement. At the end of the day, we're taking a salvage buoy, a scuba tank, and something marginally more complicated than a garage door opener and sticking them together. The tank and the salvage buoy are sized for each other. Mm -hmm. And so you can put a bigger tank, you can put multiple tanks, put a bigger bag on it. The secret sauce is in the 
electronics and in the valve that opens it. Two challenges that I had, and that's why I enjoyed talking with you, is one, you get things done simply, and to get things that, that are readily available. And our other big thing is, is safety for the crew and strength of the equipment, because it's got to be strong, which obviously when you get 3,000 PSI in there, it's a pretty strong canister. Well, and this makes their job easier, right? If we're, instead of having the first trap sitting on the sea floor when they get there, it's at the top of the water column, hanging okay. underneath this. All you need to do is have the button. That's right. And the guys that know how to sort the crab. Those guys are important. They are. So it's, it's very simple. I mean, it really is a very simple device, but it's, it does solve a uh, hundred problems. We're not months and months and months away from putting this on a boat. You know, I'm extremely optimistic about the future. With the new generation of commercial fishermen coming in and the support in the state of Rhode Island that's giving them, it's gonna provide for the next generation of commercial fishing in our state. Commercial fishing is part of our state's heritage. It's something that, you know, we're the ocean state. It's something we've done for hundreds of years and many generations. And I think that um, the future is very bright as far as commercial fishing, sustainability, and you know the jobs and the economic impact that it's gonna to provide to the state of Rhode Island in the next 20, 50, 100 years. I think there'll always be a robust fishery. I don't know how big that fishery is going to be, but I think there'll always be a demand for fresh seafood and, and, and there'll always be people that, that wanna go catch it. The future is not boom and bust. The future is to get it sustainable, harvest it correctly, get the science to support it, and take a lick every now and then. You know, if your quota has to go down 20% for a few years, it goes down 20% for a few years. It'll come back up. I like to be optimistic. The glass is always half full. I see the fishery lasting. We've been around since biblical times. Not to get too religious, but Christ picked fishermen for a reason. They're hardworking people. I, growing up, I was taught by my parents, just work hard. If you want anything in life, go out and get it. It's not gonna be easy, whether what the hell you think it is, it's not gonna be easy, go out there and get it. Hard work pays off in this industry, that's for sure. We wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think that the problems that we're tackling could be solved. Why I still do it? is to give some confidence to these young guys that were like me when they were 25 years old, that there was their only passion. It's all they wanted to do, you know, and everything they read, everything they hear, it's the gloom and doom, and it's, you're gonna be done in 10 years. I don't believe that at all. They're gonna be stronger in 10 years than they are today. And if they work with the scientists, then ultimately the resource will prevail, the scientists will prevail, and the fishermen will prevail. And that's what gives me hope, because I do think that we will be eating fish 50 years from now. It's like we, we live National Geographic sometimes. You know, we don't watch it on TV, we go out there and live it. But I graduated college and I didn't want to do anything with that. So my mom hates me. <laughs> but she sees I'm making a decent living now, so she, she sees I love what I'm doing, so it's like one of the good things too. Commercial fishing for me, it, uh, it creates a good balance at home with the family and stuff. It creates a miss factor, so you're always excited to come home, see the kids, the wife, the dogs. You, know, you, you realize how much you like what you got at home when you're out there. 